What you're seeing here is a monstrous ash cloud from Haile Gubi, a volcano sitting where three tectonic plates are tearing apart. It has erupted after nearly 12,000 years of silence. But this is not ordinary wood ash. It is made of microscopic, razor-sharp silica crystals, glass particles and other harmful minerals. This gigantic ash cloud travelled thousands of kilometres, disrupting air traffic for days. But the real question is, where does so much ash come from during a volcanic eruption? When a volcano erupts, molten rocks from deep inside the earth may come out as lava. But where does the ash come from? That is what intrigues so many people. In reality, the layer just beneath the Earth's outermost crust, called the mantle, is mostly solid, not a vast ocean of molten rock as many imagine. To understand where the ash comes from, we must first understand how lava itself is created during an eruption. So what could have triggered the recent eruption of Haile Gubi, a volcano that had been dormant for over 12,000 years? If the Earth's mantle is solid, how does molten lava form during an eruption? And above all, how can a single volcano produce an ash cloud that travels thousands of kilometers across the planet? Let us explore the answers in this video. Hi friends, welcome to another video from Science Simplified for All. We all know that as we go deeper into the earth, the temperature keeps rising. There are two main reasons for this heat inside the Earth. Every planet, when it first forms, begins in an extremely hot state. When the Earth was newly formed, even its outer layers were in a molten condition due to intense heat. As it started cooling down, the outer layers solidified first. Once they became solid, the heat trapped in the inner layers could no longer escape easily. That is why a large portion of the heat from the time Earth was formed is still present deep inside its inner layers. In addition, nuclear energy released from radioactive elements within the Earth continues to heat its interior even today. The outermost layer of the Earth is called the crust. It has two types, the continental crust, which forms the land, and the oceanic crust, which lies beneath the oceans. On average, the continental crust is about 35 kilometers thick, while the oceanic crust is about 7 kilometers thick. Both are completely solid. However, the crust is not a single continuous piece. It is made up of several separate slabs called tectonic plates. These plates are constantly moving relative to each other and such movements are what cause earthquakes from time to time, something we all learned in school. Just below the crust lies the mantle, which is about 2,900 kilometers thick. It is divided into two parts the upper mantle and the lower mantle. The mantle consists of rocks and minerals that are extremely hot. The temperature in the upper mantle ranges from 1000 to 1800 degrees Celsius, while in the lower mantle it rises from 1800 up to about 3700 degrees Celsius. At such high temperatures, you might think that the rocks inside the earth should melt and become liquid. But surprisingly, the upper mantle is almost completely solid, and even the lower mantle remains mostly solid. The reason for this lies in pressure. When pressure increases, the melting point and boiling point of any material also increase. For example, we all know that water normally boils at 100 degrees Celsius. But inside a pressure cooker, water boils only at around 120 degrees Celsius because the high pressure raises its boiling point. In the same way, even though the temperature inside the mantle is higher than the normal melting point of rock, the enormous pressure caused by the weight of all the material above it keeps the rocks from melting. So not only the crust we stand on, but even the mantle beneath it remains almost completely solid. But if both the crust and mantle are solid, then how does molten lava come out during a volcanic eruption? That is what we are going to find out next. Think about what happens when you cook rice in a pressure cooker. When you release the pressure and open the lid, the porridge inside is still boiling vigorously. So, what is actually happening here? Inside the cooker, the water temperature remains around 120 degrees Celsius. It stays in liquid form only because of the high pressure inside. 
water that exists as a liquid above its normal boiling point is called superheated water. When the pressure on this superheated water is suddenly released, it instantly begins to boil on its own. And that is exactly what happens when you open a pressure cooker. Similarly, the rocks and soil inside the mantle exist in a superheated state. Their temperature is actually higher than their normal melting point, but they remain solid only because of the enormous pressure acting on them. If, for any reason, that pressure decreases, it creates a situation just like when a pressure cooker is opened. When the pressure drops, these rocks begin to melt spontaneously, forming a molten substance called magma. This process is known as decompression melting. There are several reasons why the pressure above the mantle rocks can decrease. Each of these reasons leads to a different type of volcanic formation. Let us see how this happens in places like Ethiopia's Haile Gubi volcano. Haile Gubi is located at the junction of three tectonic plates. The major part of the African continent rests on what is known as the Nubian plate, while the eastern part of Africa lies on the Somalian plate. The third plate that meets these two is the Arabian plate, on which Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Oman are situated. The point where all three plates meet, called a triple junction, is found in Ethiopia's Afar region. And that is exactly where Haile Gubi is located. What makes these three plates special is that all of them are diverging plates. They are slowly moving away from one another. As these plates drift apart, the crust at the triple junction becomes thinner. When this happens, the pressure exerted by the crust on the mantle below decreases. The superheated rocks in the mantle then begin to flow toward this low-pressure region. Even though the rocks in the mantle remain solid because of the extreme pressure and temperature, they can still move very slowly when there is a difference in pressure. This motion happens at an incredibly slow rate, just a few centimeters per year yet it behaves almost like the flow of a highly viscous fluid. So, as the plates continue to move apart, the crust at the triple junction thins out, creating a low-pressure region. The mantle material beneath then starts to rise upward toward the crust. The important point to note here is that the material rising upward is already hotter than its normal melting point and has remained solid only because of the extreme pressure inside the mantle. As it rises into regions where the pressure is lower, between the crust and the mantle, the pressure acting on it decreases and it begins to melt spontaneously. This molten material gradually forms a magma chamber. Over time, more and more material from the mantle flows into this chamber, increasing the amount of magma inside. Even though it happened thousands of years ago, Haile Gubi has erupted before. The pathway through which magma once escaped known as the conduit, might have closed since then, but it would still remain a weak spot in the crust. When the magma chamber fills up again, magma starts rising through that weak spot. Another special property of magma is that, under the immense pressure inside the mantle, it contains large amounts of dissolved gases, such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and water vapor. As the magma rises and the pressure decreases, these dissolved gases start forming bubbles. As this happens, the magma's volume increases and its density decreases. When the density decreases, the upward pressure from below pushes the magma even faster toward the surface. And this creates a positive feedback cycle. In other words, as magma rises, its density keeps decreasing. And as its density decreases, its upward speed keeps increasing. By the time the magma travels several kilometers through the crust and reaches the surface, its rising speed can reach anywhere from 2 to 140 kilometers per hour. At the same time, the dissolved gases inside continue to bubble out vigorously, just like the fizzing bubbles that burst out of a shaken cola bottle. When this mixture of magma and gas finally breaks through the surface, that is when we witness a volcanic eruption. What we just saw is the mechanism behind a volcanic eruption that occurs at a diverging triple junction. The eruption that took place at Haile Gabi a few days ago is most likely the same type of event, though we can confirm it only after detailed reports are released. Now, let us look at another question. During a volcanic eruption, where does all that ash come from? 
As magma rises from the magma chamber through the conduit, the pressure on it gradually decreases. At the same time, the dissolved gases inside begin to bubble out more intensely. Finally, when the magma reaches the vent at the top of the volcano, its pressure suddenly drops to the atmospheric level. At that moment, the escaping gases and bubbles break the magma into countless tiny fragments, almost like a fine spray. It's very similar to what happens when you open a shaken cola bottle. The gas bursts out, throwing the liquid upward as a mist. The magma that is shattered into a mist cools and solidifies almost instantly, forming extremely fine particles. These particles contain tiny silica crystals, glass fragments, and various other mineral crystals. Their sizes can range from just a few micrometers to one or two millimeters, resembling fine dust. This is what we call volcanic ash. It is not the same as the soft ash we get from burning wood or coal. In reality, volcanic ash is made up of solid particles of molten rock that cooled and solidified directly into a fine powder-like form. Because these particles are so light and fine, the hot gases rising from the volcano can carry them to great heights. During the Haley Gubi eruption, the ash cloud reportedly rose to an altitude of nearly 15 kilometers in the atmosphere. In our earlier discussion, we mentioned that during past eruptions, the magma conduit through which lava once flowed may have become sealed over time. During a new eruption, the first thing to come out is often the debris that blocked this old conduit. It emerges as a brief dust cloud which quickly subsides. However, the ash produced directly from the magma continues to be released for a much longer time. And this is what forms the vast ash cloud that lingers in the atmosphere. A large portion of these particles, especially the heavier ones, settle not far from the volcano itself. But the finest particles can travel great distances through the atmosphere. When we say that the ash cloud from the eruption rose to about 15 kilometers, it means it reached the same altitude where commercial aircraft fly. These ash particles are microscopically small but extremely sharp. If they enter a jet engine, they can cause severe erosion to the turbine blades. Moreover, due to the high temperature inside the engine, these particles can melt and then fuse onto the blades, damaging them further. That is why aircraft are never allowed to fly through or near a volcanic ash cloud. In the past, massive volcanic eruptions have created ash clouds that spread across the entire atmosphere. Such events blocked a portion of the sunlight reaching the Earth, causing a drop in global surface temperature for several years. Layers of volcanic ash from these ancient eruptions have been discovered in many parts of the world during geological excavations. However, not every volcanic eruption produces such a large ash cloud. The amount and type of ash depend on several factors. The mineral composition of the magma, the quantity of dissolved gases, and the pressure conditions during its rise. When the magma contains a high proportion of silica, ash formation becomes more likely. But when it contains mostly basalt, the eruption tends to produce less ash and more fluid lava flows. During the recent eruption at Haile Gubi, the ash cloud reportedly reached an altitude of around 15 kilometers. Carried by high-altitude winds, it later drifted over Yemen, Oman, Pakistan and India, eventually reaching China. Air traffic along those routes had to be temporarily suspended. Experts say that because the cloud moved at such a high altitude, it did not cause major problems for people on the ground. However, a thin layer of ash has settled in villages near Haile Gubi, creating difficulties for both the residents and their livestock. Through this video, I hope you have gained a clear understanding of what happens during a volcanic eruption like the one that occurred at Haile Gubi. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like it, leave a comment and share it with your friends who love learning about such fascinating science topics. Thank you.